right, now that the canter, the filter canters have sat down, we can, we can start. All right, uh, welcome and thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Alex Hires. I'm an assistant professor in the history of U.S. education in the Education, Culture, and Society Department. This spring, the ECS department is hosting a diversity lecture series. Collectively, these lectures will examine the history of racism, resistance, and education in the United States. For our first lecture, civil rights activist Joan Trumbauer Mulholland and her son Loki Mulholland illuminated the origins and contours of institutional racism in the United States. They also shared how and in what ways each of us can engage and support the ongoing fight of all forms of oppression. For our second lecture, we have invited Dr. Max Felker Cantor. Dr. Felker Cantor is a visiting assistant professor of history at Ball State University. He specializes in 20th century American and African American history with a focus on race, politics, and social movements. Last fall, Dr. Felker Cantor published Policing Los Angeles, Race, Resistance, and the Rise of the LAPD. Policing Los Angeles traces the rise of the carceral state in the United States by spotlighting the LAPD during the period between the Watts riot in 1965 to the LAPD's beating of Rodney King in 1992. Despite being able to access the internal documents of the LAPD, which in some cases were destroyed by the police department themselves, Dr. Felter Kanner has produced an impressively sourced and engaging account of how the LAPD targeted, surveilled, and brutalized people of color with the support the local, state, and national politicians from both major political parties. At the same time, he reveals how and the ways in which African Americans and Mexican Americans resisted and organized against the LAPD's increasing and often unaccountable police power. Overall, policing Los Angeles unveils the roots and expansion of the carceral state and its consequences for communities of color, while also highlighting liberalism's complicity in that racial project. Tonight, we will hear Dr. Max Felker Cantor share a portion of his research for the book. And if you are interested in what you hear tonight, I hope you'll consider buying the book. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Max Well, Alex, thank you very much for that introduction. I think I need to hire you to summarize my book for me. Um, and thank you to William as well for inviting me um, to come to, to give this talk. And again, thank you all for coming. Um, it's really exciting to be here. It's exciting to see a lot of faces um, and in the audience of people who I've known since I was you know, like this big, as well as kind of some new people as well. Um, so again, thank you very much. I'm gonna talk today um, about policing and schools and the criminalization of black and brown youth um, in Los Angeles roughly during the 1960s and 1970s and into the 80s. It's um, part of my book, uh, which is a bigger project on policing and anti-police abuse movements um, from roughly 1965 to 1992, as Alex mentioned. Um, and I'll also build in at the end of this talk a little bit of my new research, which is delving a little bit more into the D.A.R.E. program in anti-drug education um, during the Drugs. And so that builds out of this project a little. Um, and so I'm going to start, though, with just a brief anecdote. Um, in 1973, on the left here, on, yeah, on your left here, is a man named Kenneth Hahn, who is a liberal Democrat, uh, the County Board of Supervisors. Uh, this man here is Tom Bradley, who is Los Angeles' African American mayor from 1973 to 1992. Um, and in 1973, they convened a, a series of hearings um, in which they wanted to address the problem of juvenile delinquency and what they saw as juvenile crime. Um, and as Kenneth Hahn, a Democrat, said that youth violence had contributed to, quote, a cancerous growth of juvenile crime in Los Angeles County. Um, he went on to say that, quote, schools are being described as forts and kid thugs are spreading terror through the streets. Hahn, a liberal Democrat with historically strong support in the African American community, goes on to propose a 48-point crime control program aimed at cracking down on what he called 850 hardcore youth offenders who were predominantly um, African-American and Latino, um, who he said committed 25,000 crimes across the county every year. So Khan's proposal included a whole range of things like 
to, to reduce, youth, reduce youth crime, um, things like that included the social welfare agencies in the county, uh, the courts and probation services, the sheriff's department, and as well as the Los Angeles Police Department. Hans' reforms, or supposed reforms, which I call them, were similar to those promoted by Mayor Tom Bradley in the city of Los Angeles as well. Um, and I argue, which I'll talk about today, what I argue in the book, is that their proposed reforms expose the ways the police become a central component of a wide range of institutions uh, where the police had not historically been involved. And in this case, it's schools. Um, so part of their proposals are what bring police more directly into schools. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that today. And that anecdote is indicative of a larger piece um, that I, of the argument of the book, which is that this, this expansion of police into schools represents an expansion of police power in American cities and society um, between 1965 and really the, the 1990s. Um, and so this kind of moment is indicative of these two moments that I use to bookend, um, not really a pun, but <laughs> the, the study as, as a whole. Um, so looking at schools and policing of kids and teenagers explains one of the larger arguments, and that is some of the arguments that come out of the questions that these two images might present, and that is, why do these things look so similar 27 years apart? What explains um, why two events might occur 30 years apart when, in 1965, you had protests against the police and, and demands for reform? Um, and how did this happen under a liberal mayor who was an African American? So that's the question that comes, and this is kind of the origins of the research that comes out of these two um, series of images, 1965 and 1992. And the argument that I make is that in the decades between 1965 and 1992, the LAPD resisted all but the most limited demands for reform um, made by activists and residents, and instead, with the support of a wide variety of politicians and other interest groups, Expo uh, worked on uh, expanding its power and authority. And that's the argument about using that opening story about Kenneth Hahn, that one of those places where that expansion occurs is with schools. Um, and so this 92 moment in many ways reveals that the police have become more powerful, more militarized, more brutal, and um, in some ways more unaccountable than they have before. And so this is also a story of what I call the police power, um, which to be really brief, um, was the idea that the police, as an institution of the government or the state, have the authority to ensure and maintain social order in cities. Um, and the police, in this way, help to define what is orderly or disorderly, and they constitute their own power through the ways they define crime and disorder. And so they're able to then use what was oftentimes fears of youth violence to define that as a need to then assert their authority. And so they're manufacturing those crises. They're not just responding to it is the point there. Um, so one of the central places I'll we'll talk about today um, is with policing of black youth and in schools. Much of this starts in 1965. Um, in South Central, the predominantly African-American neighborhood on August 11th, when the LAPD arrest a black motorist named Marquette Fry. Um, and without going too far into this, there's rumors of police brutality that come out of this. It's not unlike all of the kind of recent episodes of police brutality that we've seen in our own period. Um, this leads to an uprising of what I call an anti-police protest for six days in the city, sometimes called a quote, quote, riot. Um, the police come out in force, they call in the National Guard, um, they, and, and what I'm suggesting here is that they're largely responding to quote unquote rioters who they said were predominantly black youth who were participating in these quote, riots. Um, <coughs> it results in mass arrest, 4,000 people are arrested, about 32 people are killed, a whole range of things. So they mass arrest of predominantly black youth during this moment of uprising. And these are just a series of images that we're going to cover. Um, and this moment leads to um, 
demands for reform. And so the governor of California at the time, Pat Brown, um, holds or kind of um, establishes the McComb Commission. And I'm not going to talk about that, but to investigate the riots. And what that McComb Commission comes out and says is one thing that we need to do is reform the police department and the way they police in the city's communities of color. And they propose things like community relations programs in particular, and in particular community relations programs to work with black youth in the inner city that they saw as criminal or antagonistic towards the police. Um, there, there's a whole other range of reforms, things like diversifying the police force. So certain things that we talk about today, about diversifying police forces, they're proposing then. And so I can talk about that in a kind of different context. And so out of this McComb Commission report, and this is Tom Redden, and he's the police chief in 1966, is an effort to enhance and improve community relations with black and Latino youth in particular. Tom Redden um, comes in with that kind of mandate. And in 1968, they establish a community relations program, which operates under what he calls a total community involvement concept, um, that, with the idea that every officer in the police force should be a community relations specialist. It shouldn't be unique, it should be the whole department operating that way. And so they, they establish new training and all sorts of things. And this program, in their words, meant to quote, meant that, quote, the achievement of social order by both legal process and by well-ordered personal conduct can only exist if there is a partnership between citizens of the community and the police. By improving these community, you know, communication between the police and the community, the program hoped to bring residents into the project of, the, of policing the community and in, what, in some ways binding the police more closely to the communities they serve, in particular these African American communities. So the argument I make here is that community relations was really just another means by which the police could then surveil and police um, marginalized communities. Um, in particular, uh, these police community programs um, would allow officers to better operate in neighborhoods that had little reason to trust the police. Um, as, this, as then city councilman Tom Bradley suggested in 1968, the LAPD's participation in a public housing music club for young black residents reflected the ways police could be improved by strength and could be, quote, improved and strengthened by developing contacts which go beyond law enforcement. And so the police in this case were actually involved in a music program in public housing in an African American neighborhood. Um, in the idea of, and here's the kind of point about expanding the police into new areas to deal with black youth that they saw as antagonistic to the police. And so increased understanding and communication works hand in hand with the efforts um, to reform the supposedly disorderly black and brown youth. And in the process, I argue, legitimate the overwhelming presence of police in black neighborhoods by saying it's about community relations. These community relations programs, and I'll explain this picture in a minute, also focused on winning over youth that were perceived to be violent, violent prone, or oppositional. Community relations officers sought to eliminate this a punitive relationship that governed interactions with the police prior to Watts. Um, and to change the perception of the department, they, they engaged in new programs um, like this, which was the Los Angeles Police Youth Coordinator who developed an Explorer Scout program. And this is from 94, so it's a little bit later in time. But they developed these programs after Watts to um, bring police into schools and to um, develop um, these kind of close contacts between the police. In this case, it's you know, also training these youth cops, essentially, as part of the kind of community relations. And so they would place police officers in inner city schools, um, and the LAPD program emphasized, quote, friendliness and humanism of police officers. And these police officers came into contact with about 8,000 students per week in the late 1960s. Um, police and school officials believed that the program, quote, presented an atmosphere of learning, is invaluable in creating a sense of concern for orderly behavior and a sense of responsibility for the maintenance of law and order. And so bringing police into school was supposed to create these uh, 
kind of obedience to ideas of order and proper behavior in black communities. Um, other proposals include the creation of youth councils in every high school to facilitate communication with the police, um, to create a psychological understanding and support for uniformed officers, um, who, and as well as placing uh, policemen in a variety of kind of public education courses as well in, in these kind of, in public schools. Um, some of the more extravagant events included organizing trips between the police and black youth to things like sporting events, professional, um, professional entertainment venues for about 25,000 youngsters from, quote, the city's lower socioeconomic areas. Um, in 1968, the kind of really interesting one is that officers take 800 youth to, to, uh, from South Central, so from the inner city, to Camp Radford in the San Bernardino Mountains as part of an effort to, quote, combat the anti-police attitudes learned in the city. And so they're bringing youth about two hours outside of Los Angeles um, into the mountains to try to combat inner city attitudes. Um, these programs, supported by both police as well as these officials like Bradley and Hahn, promoted, brought the police me, into the greater, into greater daily contact with black youth and set the foundation for a broader surveillance and criminalization of black youth in the decades to come. Um, and one of the people that's central to this is Tom Bradley. He's elected in 1973. He's the city's first and only African-American mayor. Um, he enters politics in 1963 as a city councilman. He served 21 years as a police officer before this. And so he actually runs in 1973 on a campaign of law and order. You, I know you might not be able to see these images, but these are campaign flyers where it says, if the mayor says it can't be done, it won't be. Tom Bradley says we can have safe communities. Say, Tom Bradley says we can provide safe schools and quality education. But to blow that up a little, this one, it says, what they wanted to do was actually bring in new forms of technology to be able to monitor inner city schools. And in this case, a pen-sized radio transmitter developed at Caltech. To, into school classrooms to monitor and summon quick assistance in an emergency, as well as a whole range of other kind of partnerships between school members, police, teachers, and students. And so Tom Bradley runs on this campaign of saying, we'll, we'll bring some reform to the police, but we're also gonna, and we're gonna get discrimination out of the police department, but we're, we can have safe communities. Because he was fighting an image of him as being soft on crime as an African American man who's critical of the police. Um, and so these, these, these are kind of really interesting flyers. Uh, so he's working with law enforcement authorities, school administrators, city council members, um, and the, in the Bradley administration, they engineer what ends up becoming a more punitive juvenile justice system, and much, and much of that comes out in the schools, even as they're saying we're not doing that. Um, because what they essentially did was make sure that punishment was directed at what they called serious offenders, who, who happened to be predominantly black and Latino, and that the rehabilitation programs for the non-hardcore would be things like diversion and counseling and a whole range of other things that were primarily directed at suburban white youth. And so they created a two-tiered system of um, juvenile justice. And they strengthened, they wanted to strengthen the juvenile justice system because what they saw happening in the courts and the juvenile hall in particular was that it was a revolving door that just let the hardened criminals back out onto the street to commit more crimes. And remember, they're talking about predominantly kids and teenagers um, who they saw as violent from. And this is the kind of image here, juvenile hall to the county jail, kind of circular um, idea. And they argued that the juvenile court was actually too lenient on hardcore offenders who were oftentimes characterized um, were predominantly black and Latino. And so they joined conservatives in trying to uh, create a more a punitive system for the category they saw as threatening. Um, young sub suburban whites, in contrast, they said, you know, are more likely to be treated as status offenders to be released for counseling and other things. Um, and so at the same time as this is happening, the police start to gain more uh, power and authority to monitor and supervise youth of color as they expand this kind of punitive system into 
social welfare agencies and into schools in particular. Um, and so, and in this case, I'll talk a little bit about um, this moment is that it's happening at the same time when schools are responding to the moments of protest by students, especially in black and Latino schools in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, school officials were trying to deal with what they saw as disorder and unruliness in schools at the same time that the police are saying we have this disorder on the streets, they're saying we have a rise of crime in the schools and disorder. And so school officials are concerned. This is a moment um, in 1968 when there are protests out of black schools. Um, the famous one, the real famous one is 1968 where Chicano students in Los Angeles um, walk out of their high school in protest <laughs> over things like um, demanding better quality education, more control over decision making, and opposition to what they saw as racially discriminatory treatment by teachers. In response, teachers and administrators were mostly white, and they responded with the police to these protests. Um, pushed for, so teachers pushed for more police on school campuses in response to these protests, to say, we don't want to deal with discipline. We want to bring in the police to help us manage disorder. And so teachers, and the Board of Education passes motions at the, at the district level um, encouraging the superintendent and others to call on the police in cases of disorder. So the move narrows the role of the teachers in disciplining students and brings in policing and other forms of discipline. And so this is where the police start to expand their power into schools. Um, and so they were what was intended to limit the power of teachers in terms of their discriminatory um, actions towards youth ends up into expanding supervision by the police in schools. Um, with the, the LAUSD or the school district, along with the police, they actually pass um, rulings and kind of um, regulations that make it kind of lawful for uh, LAPD officers to come onto school grounds to put down unlawful or disorderly behavior. Um, and so that LAUS, the, the Board of Education, starts to adopt get tough policies. In response to student <coughs> protests, in other words, LAUSD administrators facilitate the incorporation of police into the city schools. Um, they coordinate with the, LA, um, the LAPD chief, chief of police at the time. Um, and what starts to end up, ha what ends up happening here is the Board of Education also expands its own police force. And so the LAUSD, or the Board of Education, starts to create um, what was originally a security section to deal with property crime and theft on school grounds to then actually incorporate a full-on Los Angeles School Police Department that, and works with the LAPD as well. So they bring police directly into schools hired by the school district. Um, they, um, in just for, if you like numbers, in 1964, there were about 15 officers. By 1974, there were 138 officers with a budget of over $4 million. By late the late 1970s, they had, um, uh, excuse me, they had a budget of $7 million, over 400 school police officers, and the school police then became the fourth largest police department in the county of Los Angeles. And so there's this expansion into police, uh, of policing into schools. Um, they're responding to national newspapers that are calling LA schools crime-ridden and violent and um, ridden by terrorism, basically. And we can talk about that. But. So this, the police start to come into new areas of social life. Um, school administrators also respond with new zero-tolerance policies. So they pair new policing with zero-tolerance policies for, in particular, things like bringing a knife or a weapon to campus, as well as a these things will enhance over time. Um, and so bringing any sort of weapon to cam campus was then um, an automatic suspension and the beginning of expulsion proceedings. And expulsions for a gun or knife increase uh, from one in 1971 to 25 in 1972. And the impact of these policies falls disproportionately on African American youth because 80% of those who are expelled are black. And so the, the problem that they're starting to target is one that's specifically um, 
targeting African Americans. Um, I'm going to skip this. They also are doing undercover drug buy programs. So they put LAPD officers, this is from the 80s, but they started in 1973, LAPD officers into high schools to buy drugs to then crack down on drug dealers in, on school campuses. Um, and they do that in both black and white schools, but in white schools, the kids who get busted for selling drugs are allowed to graduate and continue their classes and take their finals. The, the black and brown kids don't get those same luxuries. But they're, it's really kind of interesting because those don't really look like high schoolers to me. <laughs> they're on campus buying drugs. Um, and so in 74 also, Bradley makes good on his campaign promises. And they bring in all this new technology into schools, um, into six predominantly black schools, is where they put this new technology that he was proposing we need to make schools safe. They target black schools for that. Um, and administrators continue to describe inner city schools as being surrounded by mesh fences, padlocked gates, technological alarm systems, armed guards, and helicopter patrols. Um, and so these policies have this effect of criminalizing black kids while leaving suburban white kids largely to be seen as innocent victims of drug pushers and other things. Um, and I might not be able to see this, this is some of my research, is that the disparity between black and white schools, um, and this is security agents per high school, and this is a report by the Black Education Commission, which does a report <coughs> comparing black and white schools, and what they find is that inner city schools were, quote, prison-like, and employed repressive disciplinary policies. Um, in contrast, white schools had open campuses, fewer security agents, and had an absence of regimentation in the discipline in terms of their daily routines. Um, these increased security measures did not coincide with the severity or number of offenses in the schools. Uh, white schools experienced similar rates of assaults and drug offenses as those in inner city South Central, but the response to them differs. Um, along with this, the police also start to develop new types of policing, um, and this is a report from the LAPD's anti-gang division. And so I'll talk a little bit about how they're also expanding alongside school security, is the LAPD's responding to fears of youth gang violence in the early 70s. And this provides a foundation for a broader criminalization of black youth that complements what's going on in the schools. Uh, they initiate this thing in 1973. Initially it's called total resources attack against South Bureau hoodlums, or in other words, the trash unit. Um, so they were essentially calling black youth trash. Um, it consisted of 38 officers who specialized in juvenile crime and they focused on African American neighborhoods. Um, it's quickly renamed the community resources against street hoodlums or crash units um, in response to protests from black parents who said you're essentially calling our kids <coughs> which is this acronym of trash. Um, regardless of that, crash is not necessarily a better acronym either. Um, it becomes the city's anti-gang unit um, as one officer, and they really focus on arresting and removing youth from the street. As one of their kind of juvenile gang commanders said, quote, our emphasis is to remove those hardcores from the community. That's a big part of what Crash is doing. So they're, again, delineating, we're targeting a certain group of youth for removal. Monitoring, so they're starting to monitor, monitor um, known and potential gang members, um, and they establish these files in which they're collecting information on usually black youth, or they're recording information um, to enhance their ability to protect um, the, the law by the public. And these cards that they're keeping, and this is the description of them, these file cards of gang members, um, is that they would basically could collect information on any child that fit what they call the gang profile. And that gang profile that they outline in here included things like um, Latino gang members wear clothing such as the Pendleton shirt or a round or v-neck t-shirt, or shoes that range from tennis shoes to French coat shoes. Uh, similar indicators of black 
gang activity included things like the black gang member, and I'm quoting here, the black gang member likes to wear the black t-shirt rather than the white t-shirt, um, and that their pants were described as usually jeans with rolled up cuffs. And so they create in these files then descriptions of black and Latino youth that really could apply to any black or Latino youth, and they start to come into the, they put them in these files, which then later get used for sentencing enhancements and other things um, later in the 90s, which we can, we can get to. So they're using this as a way to target predominantly black and Latino youth in the city. Um, waging a war, this war on gangs here, rested on selective enforcement of juvenile laws as well, and in particular, juvenile curfew laws um, in the city. And so one LAPD, or excuse me, Los Angeles Times reporter found that in South Central, the anti-gang units um, would selectively pick up black youth for violating curfew. In the rest of the city, curfew violators would be just taken to the station and released to their parents. But in the ghetto, quote unquote, in, and I'm quoting, inner city curfew violators usually end up for a few days at the county's juvenile. So they're selectively enforcing juvenile laws um, that are about curfew violations. Um, the LAP, of course, denies that they do that, that they're doing this dis in a discriminatory manner. Um, but as one crash officer admits, quote, we send all our curfews to the hall, and he's operating in South Central. And as this LAP, LA Times reporter says, sarcastically really concluding, quote, one way to stop juvenile delinquency is to block it. And so this sets the foundation for a broader criminalization of black and Latino youth, which really extends into the 1980s, which is really um, accelerated by the war on drugs and an accelerated war on gangs in the city. Um, there's fears of rising drug use, especially around crack cocaine, um, and the perceived connection between drugs police department officials as well as the mayoral administration doubled down on aggressive and punitive approaches to solving this, what they saw as a crisis of drugs and gangs in the city. Um, and predominantly they're targeting black and Latino youth in this. It's facilitated as well by the media at the time. And so you have newspaper, news magazines like Newsweek calling this the drug gangs. Um, and there's actually statistics, um, I won't even talk about this, but they use LAPD statistics. Um, some people do some research to actually prove that all this gang activity was not always actually connected to the war on drugs. So the, the LAPD and city officials were manufacturing a connection between drugs and gangs in what I argue is a, is a way to then further criminalize and use a kind of more aggressive policing because they saw it as drug trafficking as violence. Um, and so these portrayals, like in this, uh, this is about LA, This. Um, Newsweek um, cover story, and they said things like, and I'm quoting, that crack had transformed some of the country's toughest street gangs into ghetto-based drug trafficking organizations that facilitated, quote, a form of ur urban guerrilla warfare um, that created a, quote, night scare, nightmare landscape inhabited by marauding thugs and hard-nosed cops. And so they use these sorts of crises to then expand police authority to arrest black youth in the city. Um, as Tom Bradley said, in quoting in 1985 at an anti-crime rally, we are engaged in a war against the criminals of this city, where we are engaged in a war to save our youth. Um, and he would also employ other military analogies like holding a mayor's D-Day against drugs. Um, he held a number of kind of conferences and other things on drugs, but nothing was really more indicative of this policy. And this is building on the school policies and policing that criminalized black youth in the seventies in the notorious Operation Hammer. And this is in 80, 1988 and 1989, in which the LAPD essentially on every weekend would just pick up anyone that fit the drug gang profile which essentially meant any black or Latino kid from the age of 12 to 26 and hold them overnight for 24 hours in the LA Coliseum, where USC football now plays, um, then most of them were not gang members. Most of them were never charged with a crime, but they're entered into gang databases um, where they're then 
classified as gang members. Um, and so this also does very little to solve problems, um, this is just another image of that, um, of gang violence in the city. Um, because the statistics that from the police department show that gang violence and crime continued along the same kind of trajectory between in the aftermath of Operation Hammer. Um, and it's in this moment when um, the kind of quotes that are the best that I'm really going to use today are things like Daryl Gates, who's the chief of police, says things like, some people have said that it's just our policy to go out and arrest people for inconsequential sorts of things. And he goes on to say, you bet, that's part of our policy. And he's telling this to a newspaper. <coughs> so he is overtly saying, we are going out to arrest people for nothing. Um, and it's predominantly targeting black and Latino youth. Um, but this, you know, and police knew that these sorts of measures did nothing to stop drug use among youth in the city. Um, police officials admitted that enforcement of drug laws actually did little to deter youth from using, um, using drugs. Um, as the LAP explained, quote, enforcement of narcotics violations has proven to be ineffective in combating substance abuse among our children. And so in response to this, they formed the Drug Abuse Resistance Education Program, or DARE, in 1983. Um, it's a joint program. There's Nancy Reagan, uh, I'm right there with the joint, you know, just so you know, campaign. Um, joint between the LAPD and the LAUSD School District. Is they partner together to create DARE, which brings kid, police into schools in new ways. The, pro the logic of the pro project, excuse me, is to target young people, not just who are current drug users, but potential future drug users as well. Um, and just to be, um, at the time when they initiate this program, the LAUSD school district was predominantly black and brown, is that the white population of the school district had gone below 25% by this time. So it's targeting the school district that's overwhelmingly um, students of color. And so rather than interrogating conditions in the city that might have led to drug use, uh, they focus on solutions like resisting peer pressure, building self-esteem, uh, changing behavior, promoting personal responsibility, and promoting middle-class family values. Um, as the LAP said, DARE would fill this, quote, demand reduction role by ensuring youth would just say no to drugs. There's a whole range of great things. I know some, I did this program, a number of you probably did. Um, on its face, dare and the just say no message may have looked different than the hard side of the drug war that I've kind of talked about earlier, um, involved this kind of aggressive policing and surveillance of black youth, but such programs operated within a larger punishing framework that stressed zero tolerance to drug use. Um, within this framework, dare and other of these anti-drug prevention programs complemented and legitimized an emphasis on get tough policies. Uh, if young, young, drug, young drug users failed to change their behavior and conform to, and did not dare to say no, they would face the consequences, which is essentially policing and punishment. Um, in doing so, DARE and these other anti-drug education programs legitimized intensified policing and punishment as the solution to the war on drugs. Using police officers also, the thing that was different about there is they used police officers in, as instructors for anti-drug education. And so they brought police into schools to teach a 15-week curriculum that was later expanded to 17 weeks. Um, the officers taught in their uniforms. Um, they, were not, they did not have their weapon, supposedly. Um, they were not supposed to act in a law enforcement capacity, except in, quote, emergencies. Um, the superintendent of schools is all for this. He says things like, this will be a more intensive program than what we are able to provide in health classes in the past. Um, it also means a new approach by the police toward preventive action rather than just enforcement of drug laws. Um, the initial cohort of officers, they have about 50 officers who try out. 10 of them are selected. They receive 200 hours of training. Um, they get vocational teacher certificates. Um, they wear their uniforms. Um, as I said before, um, and rather than having them serve as law enforcement officers in, or as functions of the law enforcement officers in the schools, they turned to police because of their experience, supposedly, 
with the effects and consequences of drugs on the streets. Police officers would be better made, better experienced to teach about drugs. Um, this was this police school partnership that develops was meant to again change the perception of the police as much as it among youth as much as it was about really solving drug problems. Um, youth in the program were taught to identify with police, uh, police officers through interactions in the classroom, on the playground, in the cafeteria, and at student assemblies. As one report said, um, by relating to student at students in a role other than law enforcement, officers develop a rapport that promotes positive attitudes towards the police and greater respect for law. By bringing students and police together to refashion these perceptions of the police, DARE represented what is kind of referring to as an implicit curriculum of the school, um, aimed at readjusting student values towards the police and their law and order policies. Um, this pro-police image of DARE um, was especially seen as especially beneficial in neighborhoods and schools with historically antagonistic relationships to the police, um, and they thought that it would help alleviate tension with African-American communities. Um, as this similar report said, after years of being the anonymous uniformed enemy viewed with suspicion in some neighborhoods, and they're referring here to inner city South Central by and large, it is gratifying and energizing for these officers that their children come to see them as positive role models who want to help them protect their future. Um, and you know, this is going on at the same time that they're essentially arresting black youth en masse on the streets. Um, mm -hmm. So DARE's objectives you know, embrace this kind of racialized gang and drug war. Um, inner city schools of color um, praise the program in some cases. As one principal in South Central commented, quote, great public relations were fostered between, we're fostered, right, uh, between the school children and the officer. Um, and with our location in the high crime inner city, it was great having the officer on the school grounds for all around purposes. And so DARE brings police into schools in ways that then allows the police to act as police officers, um, even as they say they're not. And because the evidence from, at least in this initial evidence from uh, principals and stuff is saying, it's great that they're there to act as police officers in addition to this other, um, the other role that they're playing. And so, uh, and here's the information I have a whole series, this is Daryl Greats, you know, so DARE help kids off drugs. It's interesting because this image in the middle is, of course, a, is prison bars. And so you're promoting a DARE program suggesting, well, if you don't, if you say no to drugs, you don't go to prison. And so that's the kind of message here. And they have billboard campaigns and all sorts of things um, all over the city. Um, and so in this light, DARE and this emphasis, and I'm wrapping up here, um, on anti-drug programs should be understood less as an alternative to the punitive policies of prison and punishment associated with war on drugs, and see more as complementary programs that reinforce and help define these new logics around individual responsibility, racial discrimination, and hierarchy, and get tough policing. Um, and so by the 1990s, um, this kind of get tough approach and expanded police authority that we've seen kind of since the 1960s produced a really kind of punishing environment in the city. Um, many impoverished residents of color regarded the police as little more than frontline agents of control, containment, and exclusion. Um, of course, this was happening in the schools. And this combination leads to the biggest moment of civil unrest in America's history in the aftermath of the Rodney King meeting on April 29th, when officers are acquitted for beating Rodney King, the city erupts in another moment of anti-police protest. Um, and the response to 92, which I'm not going to go into here, once again focuses on the perceived criminality of black and brown youth participating in the, the unrest. Um, and so by responding to fear of crime and urban uprising and police and the fear of youth violence with more efficient policing, um, law enforcement and political officials created a program that enabled greater and aggressive enforcement of law, um, uh, of law enforcement in communities of color. And so, Looking at the history of police and the treatment of youth of color and in schools allows us to rethink um, I think schools as places that have been key to building a vast carceral state or you know, in our current era of um, mass incarceration where there's over 7 million people 
parcel of control of some sort. Um, and perhaps we can think of through that ways to dismantle it. Thank you. And, <laughs> graduate student and reading literature on there are some really influential articles that were written in 2010, 2011 that kind of said like historians haven't really looked at mass incarceration or policing or prisons. Um, and so as I was a graduate student thinking about those bigger questions of scholarship, there was the kind of question of, oh well, what would happen if how how can I rethink this era of this 1960s, 70s, and 80s if I look at the police? So I was spurred by scholarship. Um, it was largely spurred by my also engagement with archives because part of the way I got into doing this project um, and the, the bulk of the um, archival, the material I used to do the research was actually from anti-police abuse organizations that had been active in LA from the 1970s through the early 2000s. Um, and so I was using their records to follow the kind of trajectory of policing. So I was in a kind of community library that just said, well, we have all these records that no one's ever looked at. And so I started to look at anti-police protests um, and their records to, to tell that story. Um, and I go back to the very first image, and in some ways of the kind of puzzlement of 1965 and 1992, is you have the two, these two moments of really iconic urban rebellion. And it's kind of like, well, how do we explain those that trajectory. Why did did things change? Did they not? Um, so in some ways, this whole book is a story of what doesn't change. Some of it is about what changes, but there. Is, so there's a lot there. Um, I always also say, you know, it's also is happening at the time in our current moment when policing and anti-police movements, Black Lives Matter, and all that was kind of starting in the air. So I was reflecting on my own position. There. That's a lot. Um, I don't know who is next. Um, so, how much at the time was there a realization that the role of the police involvement in the schools was, had this ulterior moment? Well, so I think what you see with the anti-police abuse activists are calling it out the whole time. And like the Black Education Commission, if you have them issuing reports that are saying like, they're treating our students differently. Um, but by the early 1980s, into the 1980s, with the rise of crack cocaine and drug and gang violence, is the kind of alternatives to like let's deal with these problems through other programs or other means is kind of like off the table. And so there's some initial kind of concern, but then by the 80s, there's not as much um, the proposed alternative. There's no real proposed alternatives. It's either we've got to really crack down or we're gonna have a bigger problem. I mean, in the 70s, you had things like students in the school saying, are you gonna give us jobs? Are you gonna get us other sorts of programming? Um, and of course, that does, that's not the kind of choice that the city officials make, is kind of what I suggested. Mm -hmm. Your explanation about policing and drug use are uh, all on black neighborhoods. Correct me if I am. I'm talking largely about African American. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's highly convincing, and one can easily agree, like myself, from the research that mm -hmm. high socialists are black neighborhoods. 
And sorry, I'm mean, kind of things I'm not prepared, so I'm not to ask the question. So I am like wondering, if you by any chance compare the statistics to white neighborhood, because one can also argue or doubt that this might be the same. <laughs> yeah, and so the, the so like the so for example, like some of the policing the police statistics of the police in schools is that black schools have more security officers in them than white schools. Um, by the nineteen eighties when they're doing kind of mass arrest tactics, it is that they're flooding specifically in the record say like they're putting more police officers into black neighborhoods than they are in white neighborhoods um, in response. And so and those are some of the records that I was able to find through these anti-police groups that had collected police material, is that the police are actually saying like, we are putting more officers in black and Latino neighborhoods than in the white neighborhoods, because they didn't see crime in those neighborhoods as quite the same problem. Even though there was a lot of crime in white neighborhoods, it just was defined differently. Does that make sense? So if I hear you correctly, you're saying that the police department grew and expanded in the 60s as a result of like, uh, civil rights and like the rezoning discrimination and getting like the Jim Crow policies was this sort of an extension of the state uh, legally discriminating against that sort of point Yeah, so what it starts to what starts to happen in the sixties moment is the police they start to link civil rights activism with crime. And so they what they do post Watts is say, well civil rights activists and people who are protesting the police are just part of crime. And so they are criminals. And so there's, it's, it's less, so that, so that then, what I suggest in the book, and I didn't really talk about it here as much, is that that then is a way the police use to legitimate, to say, like, we're going to continue and expand the policing of things like civil rights protests, because it's defined as unlawful. Um, even though, to our eyes, we might look back and say, well, civil rights protest is, has a political agenda, right, to change, to create change. And so, but it, at the moment, police use that especially after Watts and these urban uprisings, um, because they define those as entirely violent and criminal. Um, that's not how I define them pre predominantly, to then expand their, their discretionary authority. Does that make sense? Yeah, do you, do you have like a percentage of growth between like the 50s and 60s, or like the 60s In and 80s? In terms of like the number like of officers? Up, correct, with like 300. So I don't, the 50, so at the time of watch, the LAPD is roughly 45, around 4,000, 4,500. There's about 300 black police officers on the force at the time. By 1992, the force is about 9,000. Um, so over 30 years. And obviously the population of the city increases over that time too. But actually what's interesting is that the, num the ratio of officers per thousand <coughs> residents the ratio actually increased, so you have, so you know, not only have an increase of number of police, but an increase of number of police per person in the city. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. Uh, but. So my question is kind of picking back off of Ella a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned that the LAPD is targeting black and brown communities, but it sounds to me like the same emphasis isn't being put on Boyle Heights in East LA as it is South Central. So. Not as much in the 80s, like the 80s, kind of the war on gangs and drugs, like those kind of Operation Hammer stuff is more directed at South Central. Um, I have a whole other chapter in the book <laughs> that's about the policing of um, the Chicano movement um, in, the late 19, in the early 1970s, but also on the policing of undocumented immigrants um, in, in kind of East LA. And so they are targeting um, Mexican American and immigrant communities um, but it operates in a slightly different capacity. And so they're targeting those neighborhoods as well. Boyle Heights in East LA is also interesting because there's a, the city line um, butts up against the county and the county's the sheriff and I don't write about the sheriff as much. So there's these kind of interesting jurisdiction questions that come up, but the police are policing in Latino communities um, in similar ways. So would you say equal rates? <laughs> Or just different? I think it's different. I, I don't know. Equal rates is a hard kind of question to ask. Is it just the number of police that are there, or is it the ways? So, like the Chicano school blowouts, they're cracking down on, right? And that's a kind of <coughs> um, And so, 
it would be hard to, I'd have to, I'd have to think through what we mean by equal rates. Um, I think, that the schools the yeah, there's school, there's police officers in the school, in those schools as well. And so there's the same <coughs> kind of numbers. Um, and there's also a similar type of, a similar level of response to the Chicano civil, like civil Chicano movement protests, but Brown Braves and others are getting the same sort of attention from the police as like the Black Panthers. <coughs> and so that kind of level of, is similar. Does that make yeah. sense? And then the, the anti-police protest organization that I focus on in the rest of the book is a multiracial one. So it's black and Latino and others coming together around perceived common common issues of police police violence. So we could read from that that they are perceiving police repression in a similar way. I don't know who is next. I think. Hi. Um, yeah. I have a question about the growth of either the formation or the growth of kind of the school, school district's police force. And I, mm -hmm. I asked that working in a district that has its own police force, the school district has a police force. Yeah. Um, and what we've noticed, at least this present day, is that when we actually need the police to come to something that actually we need, we need a police officer to come for, they don't mm -hmm. come. Yeah. Um, or if they do, it's 45 minutes later or something, when we, could, when we were forced to resolve it as opposed to something that maybe we wouldn't have thought would be necessary for the police. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the kids gathering at, after school in, on the corner of the, the basketball court, or whatever, you know, having 20 kids, and then all of a sudden someone will call them, and then right. uh, something like that will happen. And, and I'm wondering if that is key to the formation, at least in Los Angeles, um, to the, the the Los Angeles Unified Police Force, this idea that uh, you know, if it's something that you would generally call the police for, call the LAPD, but if it's something, uh, but the police will then, for lack of a better word, police the students in the area, these school mm -hmm. spaces, and determine when they want to intervene. Does that make sense? Right, so well, there's a few things that what, what I'm hearing that's happening. What ha what's happening in LA too in black and brown communities is what, the, what activists and residents would call being over-policed and under-policed at the same time. Right. So being over-policed um, and arrested for like, menial things, but when you really need the police, you're not getting the services you want, right? And so that's going on in, in neighborhoods like that. The thing that is about, that's interesting is that the LAPD, obviously anything off school grounds is they're able to police. And so they're, they're engaged, so they have a whole range of programs that is help, that the, Unified School District is calling the LAPD for. Um, a lot of it has to do with drugs. And so that's the school bus program. They're also doing things like um, around truancy, where they're actually using the police to like arrest kids on the bus, like the public buses who aren't in school. So they have these truancy kind of policing efforts to, to arrest kids. Um, so there's that, but the LA school police, what ends up happening is they start as a security force, but they become deputized officers by the state of California. So they become essentially police officers, right? That then treat things like crime. Um, things that we would think of as school disorder, or things that don't need to be about police, now you have actually police officers in there. The LA school police, they were trained by the sheriff's department. So they go, they go through sheriff's training and then get, so that I would argue that they're actually responding to disturbances in school that we might think is just mere discipline, right. now is crime problem. And then facilitate the entrance of students into the juvenile justice system. Does that make yeah, yeah. sense? So, so, and, and you know, the school police department is not fully in the kind of research I've done with that. It's like someone who's writing a dissertation on that at UCLA right now from the school police department. Tom, I'll come back to that. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very informative. Um, so, I lived in uh, the Los Angeles area. Mm -hmm. Was I, I recall, and this is after the um, um, uprising mm -hmm. due to the police verdict because of the Rodney King situation, and I do recall that um, I think Daryl Gates stepped down and the, the African American chief police was um, installed for Philly. So my question is, is I don't recall was there at some point um, change for the better 
<laughs> in some ways, you could say no because they look around us today. Um, <laughs> but in other ways, what happens in LA after this moment is Willie Williams is the police chief that comes in from Philly. Um, and by and large, like, not a lot changes under his. So you have a black police chief for the first time in the city. Um, and so this is the kind of argument about how police power operates, is it doesn't actually matter if you have a diverse police force because the police still operate as police. Um, six years later, after 92, in 1997 and 1998, they uncover a scandal in LA called the Rampart Scandal, in which they find that all those crash officers that I mentioned had been engaging in planting evidence on people and shooting people and doing all this kind of stuff, stealing evidence from, stealing drugs from evidence rooms and then going out and using it and selling it on the street and stuff. And so in that sense, like, the reforms that come out of 92, which get their things out, uh, the police chief prior to that had basically life tenure. There was no way they could be fired because they had civil service protection. One of the reforms in 92 is the police chief can only be there for two five-year terms and they have to be approved after the first term. So some of those things change, but then you get these other scandals that continue on. Um, then LA goes under a consent decree, which is what's happening in cities, you know, it's more under the Obama administration, not under the Trump administration, which has said we don't want to enforce the consent decrees. And so the consent decrees mean the federal government coming in and overseeing police departments. And so that does lead to some changes in the LAPD. Um, through the, about 2013, they were under federal oversight for almost a decade and a half. Um, and at least to some changes, except that by the end of that period, you have increased arrests of black motorists um, and profiling um, because they start to use essentially broken windows type, like New York style police, like Bratton was there. And so, they, so they engage in kind of new types of police practices. The biggest one that comes out of all that is the, the new technologies called predictive policing, where they're using new like GIS technology to try to predict where crime will happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so, they're used, so they adapt to these kind of constraints to then expand new areas of, of authority, is what I would argue. And police shootings have gone up in LA. Like, you know, it's, it's one of the police departments with the highest number of shootings across the country. Still, so those are, so yes and no, like the story is, as I said, is kind of a depressing one, um, but this, I didn't talk about it today, but I think Alex mentioned it in the opening, is throughout the whole period that I talk about is you have residents and activists pushing for change and to put, to bring as much accountability and change to the, to the to, excuse me, to the department as they could. Um, and they're successful in a lot. I would argue, and the argument I make in the book is that any of the changes that do come after the Rodney King meeting and the 92 uprising are a product of the conditions which activists had created over three decades of protest. Mm -hmm. So that's a long answer to it. Does that kind of answer here? Mm -hmm. uh, I know Tom, you have one more question to open. I got two. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first one might be a short answer, but um, is it fair to say that um, part of what is happening is that as African Americans um, uh, gain in civil rights, or at least are active in claiming civil rights, this is a push to um, to move, move them outside of citizenship by moving them to incarceration. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a well, I mean, I'll, I can answer that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the that's the argument Michelle Alexander makes, right? The new Jim Crow, right? Yeah. Kind of, if I read that book, um, part of what I how I explain the kind of ride, this kind of Watts moment and all that is that this intensified policing of African American communities comes as the city goes through demographic change, and so the LA city goes from like something roughly about sixty thousand African Americans in 1940 to about seven hundred thousand by 1970. And so the police force oftentimes saw themselves as enforcers of a racial order um, that was based on segregation. And so the police force, this long history of a white police force, control. And so that's the response, I think, to this demographic change as well as civil rights protests. Um, whether it's an active means of writing sure. out of citizenship, I would say for the, you know, there, there's no smoking gun with 
and suggest that what happens with the criminalization of black youth and others is effectively a, a criminalization of that, and you know, um, limitations on the kind of social uh, their inclusion in the social um, social society of, of the United States. Right? And then the second question uh, is a more educational mm -hmm. question. Um, so in the activist response to um, this um, this kind of surveillance, this kind of um, saturation in the schools, um, you, you've got a system where um, the police are, as you say, expanding their authority. So one possible um, response to that is more accountability on the part of the police, mm -hmm. which is one thing you talked about. I wonder if there was also a response to flip the frame so that the question became not how you could police the schools more, but how you could teach police. So was there a frame that um, yeah. oh. that looked at how the police need to not just be policed, but how they need to really um, work? So that comes a little like community relations program. Is that part of it? Is that in effect, what they say is yes, the police need more training. Not just more training, right? right. It's, well, that's what they—that's the response they have. The police need to have training to view communities differently. That's like re education. Right. <laughs> well, no, there's no, there's nothing that drastic. But the way they say is, look, well, we're just going to give the officers a little more training, human relations training, uh, and the community relations programs are framed as well. The, the, the officers also get to learn about the students, right? Um, but in effect, what ends up happening is that, in some ways, it's really a PR program for the police, as well as a way for the police to kind of, you know, look good and to also try to, and it really becomes community relations really is about the police not relating to the community, but the police saying, we're telling the community what we want from you, right? So not actually listening, and so that's what ends up happening. So there's no real effort to, to your question of, Let's re-educate the, the police. It's not um, the table is from the police side. I meant actually from the community. So, oh, from the, no, I mean, there are some calls from for like, but it's always around more training. The community activists are saying like, we need to, we need community control of the police. Okay. So it's about decision making and who has the power over um, the actual Which decision making of the police. Right. So then there's some examples. I mean, the dream, I mean, to be honest, the hope would be that every office, they would assign, you know, of course I want to sell a lot of books, right? But if every officer was forced to read the book, hopefully that would actually, you know, would be one way of having the impact of scholarship, at least. But short of that, I mean, we'll see. I mean, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what, if there's anyone besides just like, the scholars the community in LA. I'll probably talk to some activists. Lawyer who works with like the ACLU and others who are talking to them. Thank you. They could use your, their drug money to buy your books. <laughs> <laughs> well, a civil asset forfeiture. It's good people to help. So I'm curious, you talk about the fact that you didn't have a lot of access to the police records. Mm -hmm. In a lot of cases, the police destroyed the records. So, how did you navigate telling a story about the yeah, well, that's a really good question, right? I mean, and, and I talk about it in the book, and the way I did that, and I kind of alluded to that, is I followed the ways that, I followed the stories of activists, because what was interesting is that the activists actually created an archive of the LAPD, because at the time, one of their strategies was to collect as much information on the LAPD that the LAPD was putting out at the time. And so in the, in these kind of police, anti-police organizations was actually a lot of records from the LAPD. And they had engaged in a lot of lawsuits that ended up in discovery motions, which led to 
the exposure of a lot of records that then lead back to this group's count, um, which the police department obviously wouldn't, might hold, but they wouldn't let me see it. And so it was really following those leads and stories to tell, and then also that's also indicative, and in the mayor's papers and others, you could see kind of the ways the police were interacting with politicians. And so in, in, in ways, the archival kind of trail of the research was also reflective of the way the police had become part of the kind of fabric of the whole city and social institutions. So like a lot of the school stuff that I talked about, some of it came from the LAUSD records, right? And so it was finding a back way into what relationships had the police made with different groups or people, and then did they have those records? Because the police themselves were not giving them. So that's kind of backwards way of reading the archive in a different way. Does that make sense? Well, somebody else go because I've asked you. Well, I'll, I'll ask this one. I have many questions. But, um, Get them, Margaret. <laughs> so, yeah. well, we've talked about this before, but I, I, I will, I'm curious if you could use your book to now think more how you would have reconceptualized the whole the movement for liberalism, liberal politics from the great society. Because what you're really saying to us, no, what you're saying to us, so you're not, you're not saying that this was a backlash. This is not a conservative right-wing backlash to disorder. This was produced by liberals. And so I'm curious at a general level, and how do you rethink, let's say, 1960s liberals? And secondly, specifically with schools, does it make any sense, and you know, Bob and I have been trying to puzzle this through, to think about that the concept of equal educational opportunity makes any sense whatsoever. That in fact, when you think about what you've written about the schools, that the concept of equal educational opportunity is just a fabrication. That it does not exist in practice whatsoever. Not because black kids or brown kids are doing poorly in school, <coughs> but because the schools aren't intended to really do that for them. So I'm curious how this all would fit in. And equal educational opportunity is a liberal concept. Right. It's central to the great well, society. Oh, really? so. Yeah. You should yeah. write a book. Yeah. You should write a book. <laughs> 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 yeah. Sure. Well, right. um, well, I think part of what I saw in the book and what I try to rethink in terms of like the 16 liberalism is that like the problem isn't is you know is not one of like is like a partisanship that liberalism is actually implicated in its kind of um, propping up of state power and police power. And so it's part of the problem is with, with liberalism as well. And that what ends up happening with equal opportunity policies, and that's what Bradley is all about, is that it shows that equal opportunity um, and ideas of fairness as a kind of way of putting, let's just treat everyone the same operates in a kind of broader context that enables, that is kind of built on top of the kind of historical structure of structural racial inequality. And so there, so I would say it's, it's part of that. Um, and that what the schools are really doing, and that's what I think DARE is important, is really just operate, you know, and you've heard about this, right? Operating as a form of like social control and not about schooling itself. The motivation for my question more than I'll ever talk is this. From the stuff that I've learned from you through the book, is if you look at the 19, so everything that I've written was looking at the 1960s through the lens of the 1930s. Mm -hmm. okay? So I was trying to understand always how we got from um, so, from from some form of redistributive notion of economic security to a notion of equal opportunity as an alternative to that. Right? Right. But if you look at it back now from your period and look back, it's forced me to try to rethink the whole thing of what the 1960s is all about. That equal opportunity doesn't really make, uh, present us a full picture of what that period was actually about. That there's really a lot of law and order built oh, I think, well, I think in, directly yeah. into that 1960s liberalism. Yeah. At the Honestly, same time that it's promoting educational policies that are supposedly liberalizing over to Yeah, I mean, law and order is central to the kind of liberal project at that moment. Right? And they're saying, and that's the whole idea around their use of like language of like safety. Is all like, you know, and that's the, the kind of idea like we are going to protect like our obligation is to 
safe mm -hmm. and make everyone safe. And so, and, and in all of the kind of policies of great society liberalism, right, and a lot of it is also about enhancing the ability of the police to maintain that kind of safety and order. And so I think the 60s have to be, and of course, I don't write about this nationally. I mean, we talked about this, like Liz, and you know, Liz, thinking about. In America. In America, yeah, I was talking about that that is a moment when liberalism is not divorced from um, water. And that they're actually, the way I write about it, right, is that it's part of a, and front lash is not the term that I want to use, like that's a weaver, um, but is that they are, they are actively um, Respond, not responding, but actively forming policy, right, that's around ideas of safety and policing, if only we cannot have the police of the 1950s, right? And so I think that's part of it. Well, you know, we have something where people do that. There was one thing that you said that scared me. I, I, I happen to be the committee chair for this kind of community police Development. And it's really to assist with um, stopping police harassment in communities of color. Mm -hmm. But obviously, and this is a multi city, all the western region of the United States, is where you know, Phoenix, Salt Lake, yeah. uh, Tacoma, LA, all over, uh, even Alaska. So, if you were to mention about police using some of these groups to infiltrate and expand a little bit more. So what should we do <laughs> not to be tricked and try to have some kind of control and but also relationship mm -hmm. that they don't just use us to for their own purposes. Right. Right. I mean I think that comes down to I mean the short answer <laughs> is well, you have to get rid of the <laughs> um, which, which is the question some activists have proposed, right? Like, um, to really solve these problems, you have to like, rethink the role of the police in society to begin with. Um, but I would say, like, the first one is, like, you have to be really clear on, like, who holds, like, decision-making authority over, like, this is what we're doing. Um, is it the police being really careful whether, like, the police are the ones coming in and saying, here's what we expect or want, right? Because it should be in theory if it's community control, the police should be saying, we'll respond to what you're asking of us, right? So it's, I think it comes down for your kind of question is about, and then the question is accountability, right? Are the police actually giving up their power or authority over like discipline and accountability of officers in this? Or is it really just a way to say, we've developed this relationship? Because one of the overriding things is in these community relations programs, they can be all well and good, but at the end of the day, the police forces all still hold the power to discipline their own officers. And the district attorneys are the ones, right, who are enforcing claims of harassment. And so if there's a kind of discussion about, well, do we do you as a committee have a way to say like we are in we have the kind of more authority and power over the decision making process of what we're doing. And the question is, what's the, what are the measures in place that the police actually live up to those decisions? I think, as well. um, you can talk a little bit about CAPA, what happened with that. Because that's a similar kind of thing, right? I mean, they were trying to really get at who was controlling the police. Yeah, I mean, well, the, the anti-police group that I write about, they're not, they don't want to work with the police. That's, the, that's what they, but they, their whole mantra was community control of the police. And so their goal was to say, they had these incremental reforms, but their idea was, what if the community members were the ones that were making decisions about who policed, how we police, um, and not the kind of police structure as it is. Because like, they would say things like, we realize we need safe communities and we want police, you know, we need police for safety. Some of that, I think, is a show because they were pretty radical, a lot of them were. Um, but they really, their whole activist agenda was thinking about decentering the power the police had over defining crime and responding to crime in certain ways and saying, like, what if we gave communities the power to either police themselves um, or um, if we had decisions over the police department in terms of, and so a lot of things they do, like we need citizen review boards of the police, 
citizens on those who then had the power to discipline officers. Um, and usually it wasn't like major discipline, it was like upwards of like fine, um, which the police are never going to So is your book better for the community groups or the police departments? Because they might say, well, I like what they're getting out of We can start to do this in the It's supposed to be a critique. <laughs> I think what the book shows is a lesson of like how adaptable the police really are. Right? Mm -hmm. To like when they're challenged, they're able to kind of maneuver mm -hmm. in response to any limit on their which is scary. I'm scary. Yeah. Um, if I say to this committee, we got people in every city, we should have this book as one of our discussions. Oh yeah. <laughs> it might be better for the community group. Well, but hopefully, like, the lesson <laughs> would be for some of the police is that because the police departments now are like we're not the police departments of the '60s, right, right? And so the question would be those lessons of like, well, can we actually, when we say community policing, are we really engaging in like dialogue and asking, working with community members rather than saying because the community members would say in like the '70s, the police weren't really ever relating to. All they did was come to these meetings and say, this is what we want. But they were there, mm -hmm. but they weren't actually like, engaging and like, really thinking. They, the, the, the honesty behind the community relations program was probably not really there. So hopefully there would be a lesson for them there, that that would be a way to rethink how you do community policing. I had someone last week, I gave this talk, a different version of this, where she said, well, have you just said, told me, and this was an activist, she's an activist scholar, um, who said, well, part of what I get from your book is anti-police activism just provided the police new ways <laughs> to criminalize people and to expand its power. And so she's like, what hope do we have as activists if the police just respond? Um, which is not what I hope to, to say anymore. <laughs> so, that's it. Yeah. So I, mean, I would hope that the police are coming back a different perspective at this moment in time, um, and it requires them to really give up some of these things. Alex, do you want to ask a last question? In case, unless anyone has. Uh, okay, two more. Last two. I don't know, Alex, do you want to call on people? I don't know. I want to cut I want to be the man. Okay. So let's talk about these copies going out to different people. Um, <laughs> my question is do you have any plans to get this book in the hands of students? particularly in Los Angeles. Uh, I have a colleague of mine who does college access stuff out there, and I used to think the impact that something like this would have on the students understanding what's happening to them as they're going through this pipeline. Right? I mean, that would be great. I don't know if I have the contacts for that, so maybe we should talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think students reading, you know, I mean, I have, like, like students in grad seminars are reading it, and, like, my students in an undergrad class in policing, but, like, having students in L.A. read because um, I, I think it's really important. I think one thing that I hope it does is that it gives, I think, a real kind of archival like story to, I think, what we can often see as just impressionistic, like, oh, communities of color complaining about the police, right? But we actually can see that that's like, the real kind of empirical history of that is there. Um, and so I think that's valuable for students to see and also, like LASD students, right, to think like this is part of a longer history that people it's not just new, it's happened. Um, which also goes to show that like, to overturn some of these policies might take a really long time, because right? Right? it took a long time to get the and then. I have a question in terms of recruitment. So um, in what way you could argue that student, particularly students of color and poor white students can see teachers as the police, uh -huh. right? I'm thinking about uh, recently, I'm hearing from my own students, uh, calling teachers snitches. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's this idea that they're the cops, they're their daily police. Mm -hmm. um, and in that kind of police state, in the, in the public school, there's constantly this idea, well, what we need to do is recruit more people of color mm -hmm. uh, so that they can be the, the police <laughs> now with these students of color. And I'm wondering if you're, in your book, if you're talking about that, how recruitment of officers, if it at all changed in terms of as Los Angeles became yeah. a, the LA that we know now, which is uh, somewhat more diverse than it was several years ago, that you know, 
do the is the argument from the police department of we need to recruit um, more people of color in the same way that educate educators talk about how we need to recruit more people of color to do this so job. By 92, the LAP um, has grown in numbers, but it's diversity within the force, the number of African Americans on the force is proportional to the number of African Americans in the state, because they had been under a, an affirmative action suit um, starting in the late 70s, early 80s. So they actually recruited a diverse police force. There's actually a diverse police force in 92, or 91 that beats up Rodney King, right? And so, um, the Latina, uh, Latino, Latinx um, officers lagged, so they were still catching up at that time. So the Latino officers were not quite as proportional to the number in the city. But the, that's the thing that the kind of argument and that we were kind of talking about is the point is that the police, as an institution, as kind of a, a power unto itself, is still in operation. It doesn't actually matter that, that it's diverse or not, right? They're still acting in this kind of capacity. Is that at least the argument? Make. And so that's why a lot of people would say, like, the call today to say all we need to do is diversify the police officer, the police forces, and then we'd solve the problem of police shootings. I would argue that like the lesson from that is you have a diverse police force that ends up beating Rodney King as part of the '92 rebellion, and that goes into the Rampart scheme. And so I don't think that's kind of a surface level reform that doesn't actually deal with this kind of underlying police authority and power that we, as you know, have given the police, the So that's not a promising question. <laughs> already answered a okay. question that I had, so now I have two. <laughs> so one was about, I wanted to know more about how you were defining activism, because there are grassroots groups, there are organizations connected to nonprofits, and so I wanted to know more about whether you were talking to folks that had a prison abolition framework, or was it just folks who were trying to repair community relations with the police? Mm -hmm. um, and then my second question was, so beyond your academic investment in this topic, what is your personal and political support for communities? I'm, I'm a former LAUSD student, mm -hmm. and so hearing these conversations are great, and I'm also angry that I didn't hear a personal connection to how angry um, these issues, like how, how this is fucked up, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm curious, and I'm, and I'm putting that out there as an ask, you know, what is your contribution? What are you gonna do? Knowing that there's a big impact that continues to harm yeah. folks, what is your personal and political investment? Yeah, um, to the first answer, um, the activists that I write about, some of them are like the Black Panthers and others, the anti-police abuse group that I focus on primarily is kind of a Marxist-oriented group that some of them would be on the kind of prison abolitionist. So that, that group is a pretty radical group in that sense. In terms of my own commitment is I've done some work with activists in LA when I was there. I don't live there anymore. Um, and so part of this is from afar, right, is hopefully is supporting, is to go in when I'm in LA, back to Tom's question, is to, to, is to, to provide any whatever kind of I can in terms of my knowledge or kind of contribution to thinking about how do we dismantle some of this kind of moment of policing in the city. Um, and I've been involved with a couple groups, like there's the youth, um, on the blank on them, um, like LA Can and others that are doing work that I was involved with with a group with Kelly Milo Hernandez, who does the kind of Million Dollar Hoods project, um, where we were working with activists there. My own work is I'm doing work in prisons in Indiana, um, where I'm bringing college into prisons. And so that's kind of my active, and doing work with abolitionist groups in Indianapolis, those are kind of like, but being so far away from LA, the activism there is not good. Great, thank you. Thank you.